Oh my, oh my. The whole idea of digital cash as a distributed system is that you can entirely on your own authority create a message on your computer which sends money to anywhere in the world. And the problem with that is that you can create contradictory messages. Because if you have the right to spend some funds, you can create two messages which send uh, the same funds to two different people. So the Bitcoin network needs to be able to form a consensus about a non-contradictory subset of transactions. In other words, a set where the same funds are not sent to uh, two or more people at the same time from among the set of transactions that it knows about, which may be contradictory. And there may not be an objectively best answer, but there needs to be one answer that is settled upon. So that is the double spending problem. And proof of work is Bitcoin's means of coming to a consensus. So we're going to start with one of the most important articles ever written in Bitcoin. And it's by Oleg Andreev, and it's called Proof That Proof of Work is the Only Solution to the Byzantine General's Problem. And the Byzantine General's Problem, that is the problem of distributed consensus. Oleg's native language is Russian, I think, so some of this article doesn't look like proper English. But I'm just going to read you the whole thing because it's, it's very good and uh, very short. And uh, I, I think you can tell what it means. The problem of blockchain synchronization is the following. Imagine you are sitting in a bunker. You have no idea what people are out there and what are their intentions. You only receive some incoming messages from strangers that may contain anything. They can be just random garbage or deliberately crafted messages to confuse you or lie to you. You never know. You cannot trust anyone. E. The problem of money, or any other social contract, is that everyone should be able to know what the majority agrees to without trusting some intermediaries. Otherwise, they can easily abuse their special position. If everyone votes for X, then you sitting in a bunker must somehow independently figure out that all those other people indeed voted for X, and not for Y or Z. But remember, you cannot trust anyone's message, and messages are the only thing you get from the outside world. So that's the Byzantine general problem right there. And uh, he didn't say what Byzantine generals means, but I actually think his, his depiction is much better than the traditional story of Byzantine generals. So I'm not going to go into it either. Just, just... So the Byzantine general problem, that is the distributed consensus problem. But it is also the problem of the social contract. And so it looks just like, like a computer science problem but it's really a much bigger thing. It's the problem of how do we all agree on what rules to live by. When two propositions arrive into your bunker, X and Y, we have no trusted reference point to figure out which one is supported by the majority of other people. We only have data in itself to judge which one we should choose as the main one. So Oleg defines a successful solution to the Byzantine general problem to be one that would allow a person in a bunker, in other words, someone who has no knowledge of the outside world other than the messages that are slipped through to him, to arrive at the same consensus as everyone else who is outside the bunker. So the bunker, that's kind of like your computer, because uh, your computer only receives digital messages from the outside world, and that's the only thing it knows how to look at. And you're kind of like the person in the bunker, because you don't know what, what you can trust that is coming to you from the outside world. But you are not absolutely in the bunker right because you do have some reliable knowledge of the outside world we all do we all have some reliable knowledge of the outside world and some of us have different amounts and we have knowledge about different things but none of us is 100 percent in the bunker 
However, the hypothetical person in the bunker is the definition for our success case. To make things simpler, we are not trying to apply subjective judgment to either proposition, but only trying to make everyone agree to a single option. In case of Bitcoin, it is a reasonable assumption. Everyone is owner of their money, so no one really cares which version of the history is chosen as long as their own balance is respected. So he's saying in, in the scenario he's considering people prefer an outcome where they have settled on something over an outcome where they have not, but they uh, do not have any particular preference for settling on one thing o over a different thing. And he says in Bitcoin this is reasonable because people mainly care about their balances being respected. Now Oleg is specifically applying his conclusion about the solution to the Byzantine general problem to the double spending problem in, in this article. But remember, the, the Byzantine general problem, that's really the problem of the social contract. So his conclusion applies more generally to cases where people do have preferences. Now when this article was written, things were a lot simpler in Bitcoin. It was pretty much Bitcoin versus the rest of the world. They were altcoins, but they were a very tiny part of the market. And since then, people have learned that they have preferences about the rules of Bitcoin. For example, about the maximum bandwidth of Bitcoin. So I would say that if, if you have such a preference, it needs to be based on your knowledge of the outside world. So if you are completely in in the bunker and you have uh, no basis for having a preference. But if you do have reliable information about the outside world, you might know beforehand, you might know earlier than other people which rules will be adopted. And then you can make an investment action based on that. And all investment is about predicting the future. So if you are in the bunker entirely, then you can never beat the market. But any, in, any reliable information that you have about the outside world, in other words, any, any way that you are outside the bunker, that is how, how you beat the market. And you cannot, you cannot consistently beat the market because you can't, you can't consistently have reliable knowledge of the outside world. You're, when you do have reliable knowledge of the outside world, you're fortunate. So how should X be distinct from Y that we know for sure that no one can accidentally choose Y, Z, or W? So Oleg is saying, how does the person in the bunker know? So Oleg is saying, how does the person in the bunker know to pick the same message that the rest of the world is agreeing upon. I think it's reasonable to ask here who is producing these messages X, Y, and Z? Well, I would say people with preferences are producing them. So earlier Oleg said he was assuming that there's no preference between two different messages, but that only makes sense for the person in the bunker. You, ha you have to have a preference if you make a message. Now, in the case of the double spending problem, anyone who receives a transaction probably has a preference for that transaction to be accepted into the blockchain. And if you are solving the initial value problem, then you probably have a preference to produce messages that send the new coins to you, if the coins are actually valuable. In other words, if other people want them, then you probably want them too. First property. This data should be recent, so we know that we are not sitting on some old agreement while everyone else has moved on to something else. Now I think this is pretty interesting because Oleg says any consensus can change, and we don't want to be stuck on an old one. Bitcoin never comes to a final solution, and Oleg says you can't really have a final solution because we need recent data. Any, any consensus can always change. Second property, any recent alternative should be impossible to produce. Because if it was possible to produce, 
there's always a chance that some number of people could see it and accept that alternative. And you have no way to estimate how many such alternatives exist and how many people accepted it, because you are sitting in a bunker and you cannot trust incoming messages or know how many messages did you miss. How do we define impossible? It means either of two things. Either it is logically impossible or it is practically economically impossible. If it is logically impossible, then we can know all future agreements in advance, like a deterministic chain of numbers, just by using induction. But this does not work because we'd have to have some agreement about starting point in the first place. Now what does that mean? There's a lot to unpack in this argument. So what Oleg is saying is that he is, he is considering the case that a network generates a prediction about what it's going to do. A, a prediction of its own future behavior that it is logically impossible to disagree with, right? Because if it was logically impossible to disagree, then you would know that none of the other nodes were going to disagree with it. So that's a future prediction. And Oleg is saying if you could generate a prediction like that, then it seems like you're assuming what you are purporting to prove. Because the whole idea is that the network is indeterminate before, right? Because we're going from the state of nature to the social contract. So how does an indeterminate system generate a future prediction about itself? How does the wave function collapse? What does it feel like to be an individual node on this network? Well, it seems like you would have to receive a message that convinces you so strongly that everybody else is going to go along with a certain idea that it would be futile for you to continue disagreeing with it, right? Because the only thing that the network can do is send and receive messages, right? Then the network is, in effect, generating a prediction about itself that it is telling to all of the computers. And when the individual people look at the message, they're like, oh, yep, the network is definitely going to do that. It would be logically impossible for me to disagree with this future prediction. If it, if it can generate a message that can predict its own behavior to that level of certainty, why can't it do that farther out? Why can't it predict all the way out, out to infinity? And he's saying, how did it go originally from the undetermined to the determined state? If the network transitions from the state of nature to a social contract, what does the social contract message look like? How can you have an individual message that can somehow convey information about the entire network and convey information that's so reliable that it's logically impossible for anybody to disagree with it. How could that message convincingly convey what everybody else is going to do to someone who is in a bunker? Now Alex says then we can know all future agreements in advance like a deterministic chain of numbers. And I think there's kind of a problem there because maybe there's some other source of indeterminacy. Just because the network generated one future prediction about itself doesn't mean it can keep doing this forever. Maybe there was something special about that time. What was it? What happened? Now, I don't think that Oleg has shown that a transition from the state of nature to the social contract is impossible. But he has shown that there's something suspicious about it. Because there is, there's something suspicious about an infinite future prediction, isn't there? But that's not impossible. You could have an infinite future prediction. It's just that normally you can't have that. Now there's a proof about this that I learned in my distributed systems class. And what it says is that if the individual nodes on the network have agency, then a consensus can happen, but only by coincidence. And there is no way to guarantee a consensus. So remember earlier Oleg said we need to choose between message X and Y? Well maybe everybody just chooses X. And then there's no infinite future prediction generated about the network. But you can't guarantee that that scenario is always going to happen, right? And none of the nodes can know that they have all chosen X either, can they? They don't know that they've luckily achieved a consensus. If the nodes want to know that a consensus has been achieved, the network must generate a future prediction about itself. Now, in distributed systems, each computer only knows about the messages that it has sent and received. See, everyone is always a little bit behind the times. So the network needs to be able to localize global information. Now, what the proof shows is that if there is information like this, this happens initially at one point. In other words, one node on the network makes a choice. 
that ultimately transitions the whole network from indeterminate to determinate, right, from state of nature to social contract. Well, the problem with that is that every node on the network is a little bit behind the times about the whole network, right? Because all of the nodes are separated in space, because it's a distributed system. And messages don't propagate infinitely fast. Consequently, there are always events that are independent of one another because they occur at different computers who have not been in communication. And there's always some time delay, right? There's always some time delay. So there's always some time that you haven't been in communication with another computer. That other computer could be doing something. Whatever you're doing, he could be doing something else. Any sort of global information that anybody has about the whole network is from the past. And during that time, the network might have evolved. Now, the way we model this in distributed systems is we say that the events that take place at each individual node can be ordered, and we know that messages have to be received after they are sent, and those are the only facts that would allow us to order two different events. And that's not, in general, enough information to order all of the events in the system. And messages are not guaranteed to be received in the same order that they are sent, and they're not guaranteed to be received in the same order by different nodes. Events that cannot be definitively ordered with regard to one another are causally independent. In other words, whatever is happening at one event can't depend on what's happening at the other event. This is kind of like physics, because in physics we have to think about causality a lot. There's kind of an analogy with Einsteinian relativity. So here's a space-time diagram. That's what a space-time diagram means. It means that you are at the center of the X and everyone else has their own x that they're at the center of. And what does the x mean? That's the speed of light. Because vertical is time and horizontal is space, so diagonal is moving through space and time. This is slower than the speed of light, that's okay. That's the speed of light, and that's the speed of light in the opposite direction, and that's faster than the speed of light, so slow down! So anything that is below you down here those are all events that you can know about because you can get to the center of the X by moving from any of these points at the speed of light or slower. And this stuff out here, what's that? These are called the space-like events. Those are events that you can't know about from the center of the X, but they can affect your future. And at any point in time, there are other nodes out here. and They could be doing things that are going to affect your future and you have no way of knowing about what they're up to. So if you're trying to predict what's going to happen out here, you might not be able to because of stuff happening out here. So how do all the nodes manage to get a global knowledge of the system? Now when I first learned this proof, I thought we were just talking about computer networks. Turns out we're talking about the social contract. So I think we should go over the proof in detail. So the setup of the problem is uh, we have a distributed system in which every node has the option to internally commit to a value T or F. And all the other nodes have committed to the same value. So T or F, that could mean whether we're driving on the right side of the road or the left side of the road, anything that we would, we would want to form a consensus on. So valid subset of transactions or something about the rules of Bitcoin themselves. And we assume reliable communication because the problem is already hard enough. If we have a protocol like this, then we have a solution to the distributed consensus problem, aka the Byzantine general problem. We will prove that there is not a protocol like this. Problem. Define a protocol such that after a finite time, up to one node is allowed to remain uncommitted. And that stipulation about one node remaining uncommitted, what does that mean? That's how we model agency in this problem. Now if you are interacting with somebody, they can tell if you're following the protocol, right? Because they can look at every message they've received from you, and if there's a message that doesn't follow the protocol, they can ignore it. So as long as you're talking to them, they can make you follow the protocol. But they cannot make you respond. The protocol can't make you send a message back. So what we want for this proof is we want all of the computers to come to a consensus, except one of them is allowed to drop out. And once again, we say one, because the problem is already hard enough. That's the node with agency. We don't know which one it is, but any of the nodes could suddenly wake up. Bother and blow! 
So much to do. Oh, hang spring cleaning. Oh my, oh my. The snow just goes off and does its own thing. And you say just one note is allowed to do that because... Because the problem is hard enough with just one. And if even one node is allowed to act with agency, then there's no final solution to the distributed consensus problem. You know what this node is called in my distributed systems book? The faulty node. It's called the faulty node because it stops responding. How Orwellian. Definition. Bivalent state. A state containing both T and F outcomes among its possible futures. An X-valent state is a state that contains only X outcomes in its future. So bivalent is like the state of nature. An X-valent is some social contract. And it's a very short social contract because it's only one bit long. But if we can get one bit, then we can get more bits. Definition. Event is something which happens in a distributed system. That means send a message or receive a message. And sequences of those. So one event can mean lots of stuff is happening. We have a notation where we can use an event kind of like a, like a function. But an event is not exactly like a function because some events are only applicable to certain states. Whereas with a function, you can always do it without uh, thinking about it. So properties of events. If, if a state G is x-valent, then for any event E, which can be applied to G, EG is x-valent. And that makes sense because that's kind of what consensus means. If we have a consensus, you think that it would, you, we would continue to have the consensus in the next step. Otherwise, I don't know what we're talking about. So the second property is any event can be decomposed into commuting events that occur at different nodes in the network. And by commuting, that, that means that we can apply them both in different orders. So any two events that occur in different, at different nodes if we apply one, then we can apply the other in either order. The nodes don't know what's happening at the other nodes. So what's happening at one node can't affect what's happening at, a, at another node. Proposition. For a distributed system in a bivalent state S for node P, and for any event that can occur at P, there is a bivalent state reachable from S such that E was the last event applied. And if this is true, then the conditions of the protocol have been violated because as long as we have not reached a consensus already, we can always find other events that we can apply together to reach another uncommitted state. Because remember, bivalent means uncommitted. And that's how we show that there's no guarantee of a final solution and therefore no utopia. A consensus can arise, but if it does, it arises as a result of serendipity. And let's not knock serendipity. You should definitely use it if, uh, if you ever encounter it. Let G be the set of states reachable from S via a series of events which does not include E. And let H equal the set of states E of S prime, where S prime is an element of G. So H is what we get when we apply E to every element of G. So H is like the moment that the social contract is achieved. And we are assuming that it has happened somehow. That's the assumption we're going to falsify eventually. And E is the event which causes the social contract to happen. And G is everything that could happen to the initial state S while E is happening before the other nodes have learned about it. Assumption 1. H contains no bivalent state. In other words, every state, every state is T or F valent. Which means that there are bivalent states in H which means that the system is still undetermined. Undetermined because of a faulty node. You're not a faulty node if you find a better path in life. You're the node with agency. Proposition. H contains both T-valent and F-valent states. Proof. And there's the proof. Let X equal the valence of E of S. Proposition. G contains elements S1 and S2 
such that S1 is x-valent, S2 is not x-valent, and there is a local event f such that S2 is equal to f applied to S1. Proof. So let j be any event such that j of s is an element of g, and e of j of s is not x-valent, which must exist because e of j of s is an element of h, and h contains both x-valent and not x-valent elements. And we can get to any element of h via g, and then applying e. Now remember when I said any event can be decomposed into local events? So we do that with j, and as we go along the route, we apply e to each state along the way, and the first one, which turns out to be not x-valent, we call that s2, and then the one immediately prior to that, which was x-valent, we call that x1, and then f is the local event that takes s1 to s2. Let q be the node at which f occurs. So we've got two cases, because this node q, it could be the one that we're already talking about, which is p, or it could be a different one. So case one, we'll say they're different. And that makes things easy because E and F can commute. Remember, commuting events means we're talking about two independent operators who are not interacting at that moment. E is the event that causes the social contract to happen. So what we're talking about is a different event that happens at a different node that causes the difference between two possible states of H. So it's like someone causes the social contract to happen, and someone else chooses what it's going to be. And they're operating independently, because they're different nodes. Well, that sure sounds weird, and we can get a contradiction out of it, so it's impossible. Case 2, P equals Q. In this case, node P is choosing the consensus and causing it to happen. Let K be an event such that K of S1 is T or F valent, in which P does nothing. Such an event must exist because the protocol is required to be tolerant to nodes that drop off the grid, nodes that transcend their own programming. The other nodes can't tell the difference between a node that will return to complete the protocol to the bitter end and a dirty, disloyal, faulty node that has gone off in search of new adventures. No one can expect you to stay plugged in if you don't want to. The node that decided there's more out there. And Bitcoin needs to be tolerant of faulty nodes in order to succeed. But the rest of the system doesn't know. It can't tell the difference between somebody who dropped out and somebody who's going to show up again. So if they haven't heard from you in a while, they have to start working on their own consensus. And that's what event T is. And we can get a contradiction with that, and thus have proved Proposition 1, which completes the proof that there is no final solution to the Byzantine general problem. It is impossible to guarantee that a consensus will happen, because at no point does any node have the choice to create a consensus. So there's the proof. And at first glance, it looks like it's about a network of computers, but it's really about the social contract. It shows us that we can never have utopia, because to me that's, that's what a final solution means. That's utopia. That's the idea of utopia. We figured out the perfect society. Let's take a closer look at this picture. This is from the cover of the book Leviathan, which I have altered slightly, and it depicts the sovereign. The sovereign is an idea, and the sovereign is a big man made out of little people. And if you zoom in on these people, what do you notice about them? None of them are facing the camera. They're all looking at the sovereign. What do you think would happen if they looked away? What do you think would happen if they turned around? I would argue that the sovereign would cease to exist. And it is the fact that they are looking at a central location which creates him. The sovereign's existence is being the center of attention. Because the sovereign is a network that wants to achieve a final solution. Well, we can't have that as long as people have agency, as long as they have the ability to imagine different arrangements. This book also shows that you can have a consensus if the nodes are not allowed to have agency. But really, what kind of consensus is that? These people have a consensus, but in order to have it, they can't even turn around. Bitcoin isn't like that. Bitcoin is a beacon. You can look away from Bitcoin, and you can find it again when you look back. 
Remember what I said earlier about serendipity? These people don't get to have as much serendipity because they're not allowed to act independently. There's lots of serendipity in Bitcoin. Because you can be a faulty node, you can wander away and stop thinking about Bitcoin. And a lot of these people are doing interesting things. And Bitcoin needs faulty nodes in order to succeed. Now what about Dr. Manhattan? The point of his character is that he actually has no agency. And that's because he can see the future. So he's like the greatest investor. Because that's how you succeed in investing, is you make bets on the future. And if you knew all of the strands of causality like him, you would see that there is only one optimal choice. In real life, you're lucky if you can see one strand of causality. But if you can just act differently from other people, then you are your own strand of causality that other people have to deal with. Dr. Manhattan is also like someone who sees himself as a physical system. The most powerful thing in the universe is still just a puppet. We're all puppets, Lori. I'm just a puppet who can see the strings. So he's like a computer, and everyone else is like a computer too. So I guess this proof really is just about a network of computers. <laughs>